Well, good morning. I just want to warn you, I'm going to speak in gusts of up to 600 words per second. Amen? The way some of you men talk to your wives. Amen? And you see, it might go to 800. might go to 1,000. We do that on purpose because we're going to cover a lot of ground. And so I'm delighted that we can be together this morning and that we can take a focus for some time on the authority of the Word of God. And my desire is that through our sessions and through our meetings, that you would get a much greater appreciation for the authority of the Word of God. Because this is what it's all about, as you will see. And God gave us his word, and we can trust it. And yet I hope that as you see through our times together, you will see how the non-Christian world is trying to influence you away from the word of God. Because that's what it's doing. And that's the battle, the battle in the mind. So I'd like to start out by showing you this verse, 1 Peter 3.15, where the Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I wonder if someone came up to you today and they said, hey, where did Cain get his wife? Could you answer that? What about dinosaurs in the Bible? Is there really a God? Why is there death and suffering? These are all legitimate and real questions that I had before I became a believer at 22 years old in the United States Navy in Goose Creek, South Carolina. And you see, there's a reason those questions are there, because they're good questions. And they all have to deal with our understanding of the Word of God. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? They're lost. In whom the God of this world had, and there it is, blinded the minds. And it's your mind that is the battlefield. It's your mind that is what makes you you. He's blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine unto them. And so I submit to you, it's all about what? It's all about the authority of the word of God. By the way, we're also going to be using a lot of PowerPoint slides. As a matter of fact, just to give you an idea, we're going to do 114 just in this session. The next session is 169. Tonight it'll be something like that, and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. So there's lots of stuff on the screen. But it's all designed to help you understand the authority of the Word of God. Because this is the authority. The question is, how do we view it? How do we perceive it? How do we treat it? And is it a part of our worldview? And so we're going to spend the next four days examining your worldview. You know, we live in the United States. We've got the largest amount of churches, colleges, seminaries, bookstores, radio and TV, and yet our country is becoming less Christian every day. Have you noticed it? If you haven't, you need to open your eyes because it's warfare, folks. That's what it is. It's spiritual warfare, and it takes place every moment of every day in everybody's life. And so when we consider our worldview, we're asking this question. How do you interpret the world that you live in? Because that's what a worldview is. It's the overall perspective of how you see and interpret the world that you live in. And your worldview is directly related to what you believe about the history of the world. Did you know that? Because what you believe about your past history will affect how you live in the present. Amen? Amen. Yes, indeed. You see, if you believe you came from pond scum, you're going to live that way today. If you believe in molecules to man evolution, that is your worldview. But if you believe the Bible gives us the real history of the world, it's going to affect your worldview and how you live today. And so what you believe about the past, indeed, will affect how you live in the present. I found this old slide. I thought I'd share it with you. This is one of the slides I had back in 2000. Uh, well, we opened the museum in 2007, so back in about 2002, we started using this. It's a great little question. It's a lot of fun. Hey, did kangaroos ever live in the Middle East? I don't want to embarrass you, so don't raise your hand. But I wonder how many of you believe kangaroos once lived in the Middle East. 
And you know what the answer is? All of your hands would be up. Really? I thought kangaroos only live in Australia. Well, that's because you don't understand how much history affects how you think about the world you live in in the present. Because the Bible says God created, and then what? Sin came into the world, and then there was a global flood, and all the animals, two of every kind, got on the ark, and the ark landed where? In the Middle East. Are kangaroos a kind? Yes. Did kangaroos once live in the Middle East? Yes. Did penguins once live in the Middle East? Yes. All the animals once lived in the Middle East. Oh, I know, that's a silly little illustration, but you get the point, amen? What you think about the history of the world affects how you live and how you think in the present. There's a secular worldview out there, friends. Do you realize that? Evolutionists have certain beliefs about the past that they presuppose. For example, there's no God or at least none that performs special acts of creation. And so they build a different way of thinking about the world that we live in so that they can interpret the facts to the present. That's what they do. And our country and our educational system is saturated with this ideology. And we're going to explore that. You see, a secular worldview, philosophically secular humanists, what they are, they're naturalists. That is, they believe that nature is all that exists. The material world is all that exists. There is no God, no spiritual dimension, or no afterlife. This is Carl Sagan. My dad was a worshiper of Carl Sagan when I was a little kid. We would put it on TV, and he'd make us sit there and watch this. And my dad didn't come to know the Lord until very late in his life, and I praise God that he did before he went into eternity. But Carl Sagan, the universe is all that there is or that there ever will be. That secular worldview, secular humanism then can be defined as a religious worldview based on atheism, naturalism, evolution, and ethical relativism. That's what it is, and it saturates our whole education system. And this is what it boils down to. It boils down to man determines truth for himself apart from the Word of God. So when you sin, you know what you're doing? You're determining truth for yourself apart from the Word of God. Because when you understand the Word of God, it leads you to who? It leads you to the feet of the cross. And when you're at the foot of the cross, I should say not the feet, the foot of the cross. When you're at the foot of the cross, you realize Jesus is who he said he is. And he's what? He's the creator. And he's the sustainer, as we'll see this morning and through the rest of the week. But secular humanism, man determines truth for himself. And so, 1 Corinthians says, but the natural man, he what? He receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Why? For they are spiritually discerned. You know, as a Christian, you should not be surprised about those who don't believe in the Word of God. Why? Because the majority of them are natural men. This is how they think. So when they act contrary to the word of God, it really shouldn't surprise you. What did you expect them to do? Amen? When I became a believer riding the USS Benjamin Franklin, hull number SSBN 640 for the United States Navy, I went back out to sea the first time as a believer, the only believer on the submarine. And I was shocked at the way we lived. I had never seen it from the other side. I had only lived in it one way, and that's all I knew. Now I started studying the Word of God, and it was totally amazing to me how we live in two different worlds. And you see, the natural man is outside of the authority of the Word of God. It's outside of his worldview, and it shouldn't shock us. So how is it that we get indoctrinated into this kind of thinking? Well, it happens in all sorts of ways, like advertising, right? All you hear is millions of years and millions of years and millions of years and millions of years and on and on, over and over and millions of years, and all of a sudden, it's in your mind that the earth is millions of years old. And you see, it gets promoted. It is a battle. Here's Time Magazine. Is a Bible fact or fiction? Where does this magazine sit when you go to Walmart? Right there at the checkout counter. Why? Because it's warfare. Okay, and it challenges the authority of the Word of God. Here's a, an article from the Daily Mail. 
you know, fossils reveal life on Earth bounced back very quickly after the dinosaur-killing asteroid hit 66 million years ago. Praise God, by the end of this seminar, you'll be able to read something like that and laugh. Why? Because that's pretty funny. Why? Because that's absolutely impossible. And yet they promote it. They keep saying, oh yeah, it hit down here near Mexico, Chicxla Crub cr Crater, that's what killed all the dinosaurs. Hey, why didn't it kill everything else? Right? Where's the asteroid at the bottom of the crater? It's not there. Why? Because it didn't happen. Yet they promote it. And they promote this all the time. When I was a kid, I went to high school. I was taught right here at the beginning, somewhere, somehow, no one knows exactly where, no one knows exactly when, there was this blob. Inorganic material became organic. Now that's fascinating, right? And then through long periods of time, it gained information. It grew into something else. It changed and changed and changed until we get to man at the top of the food chain. Dr. Tim Lee said it this way. He said, I was a tadpole when I began to begin. Then I was a frog with my tail tucked in. Then I became a monkey in a coconut tree. Now I'm a man with a PhD. Would you believe me? Yet a lot of people do. And that's what they teach. How does it happen? They go to places like the Grand Canyon. And they say, look at all those layers. Oh, that just proves to you that the earth is millions of years old. And what's in those rock layers? Oh, a bunch of dead things. What does it represent? Death, disease, pain, and struggle, and suffering. See, the earth is millions of years old. And I submit to you, maybe by the end of this message, you'll see that that's not true. And yet, that's the way it's taught. Evolution basically says science has proven you can't trust the Bible. That's part of their message. And that message is absolutely false. They're saying the natural world proves that the Bible is wrong. And I'm going to submit to you that what we find in our world agrees with what we read in God's Word. Because when we begin to interpret the evidence in light of God's Word, we get a whole different solution than what the secular humanist sees. This is a quote from Frank Zindler, an American atheist. He said the following. He said, The most devastating thing, though, that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. Now that we know that Adam and Eve were never real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. If there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there's no need of salvation. If there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I believe that Evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, this man understands the issue better than a lot of Christians. He understands the issue better than a lot of Christians. Because if I can destroy the foundations of Genesis, I've destroyed everything that you hold near and dear in the word of God. If Genesis 1-1 and beyond is not true history, then we are wasting our time. That's what it comes down to. It comes down to the authority of the Word of God. And so, how about Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the worst serial killers in the history of our country? Listen to what he said in an interview with Stone Phillips and Dateline. He said, if a person doesn't think there's a God to be accountable to, then then what's the point in trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believe that the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. Why did Jeffrey Dahmer kill another human being? He did it because of his worldview. Worldview. What you believe and how you interpret the world that you live in impacts how you live in the present today. And the problem isn't just outside of the church. The problem with secular humanism, it's crept into the church as well. I've seen over the years since working at Answers in Genesis for just under 10 years, I worked full-time for Creation Ministries International for over six 
full-time in my own ministry. I pastored for about four years at Finger Lake Baptist Church in Geneva, New York. And all the time I've been in ministry, I've been amazed how the book of Genesis is attacked by the world that we live in. Oh, you don't need to worry about what's going on in Genesis. Eh, it's just a bunch of stories. It can't be trusted. So many ways to interpret it. We need to just tell people about Jesus. Actually, heard a lady say that at a seminar. That was more important to her than understanding origins. And she had no idea that the very truths that she was proclaiming about Jesus start with the real history of the world. Why? Because you can't be saved apart from the real history of the world. You can't. And if you don't understand what God did in Genesis, you're going to have a hard time doing what? Asking God to forgive you of your sinful condition because you don't even know how you got it. Amen? Because if you don't know what happened in Genesis, you have no idea why Jesus came. And then you're going to have a hard time understanding who he is. And so... Genesis. I'm just amazed how Christians are ignorant of the importance of Genesis and the authority of the Word of God and how to apply it in your lives. In the churches in America today, we mention how far America is going away from the Word of God. Did you know that this year, on the 10th and 12th of February, 343 congregations in the U.S. held Evolution Sunday? where they stood up in their pulpits and they said evolution and the Bible are absolutely compatible. As a matter of fact, there's over 13,611 members of, quote, the clergy in the United States that have signed on to this document saying, hey, evolution and the Bible are absolutely compatible. You see, it's not just a problem outside of the church. It's a problem within organized churches and religions in our country as well. Now I'm going to get a little exercise for the young people. Amen? If you're in here this morning and you are 18 years old or younger, or you're a parent of a child 18 years old or younger, I want you to raise your hand. Okay? If you just hold it up high. Okay. Wow, i got a whole pile over here. Oh, that's your family. Amen. <laughs> Great to see you, brother. All right, so we've got about 30. Hold them up. Maybe 40. Okay, we've got about 50 hands raised. I want you to consider what is happening in our country. The Southern Baptists have found a big problem within their church. And that is their churches are getting smaller. And they've done extensive research. And their extensive research has revealed this. That 88% of children that are raised in the evangelical homes now leave the church at the age of 18 never to return. What if you lost 88% of your blood? What would happen to you? Well, you'd be dead. That's what would happen. Amen? And we just had 50 hands raised. And if that statistic is true... What if 88% of those people were not in the church at the age of 18? It's not just the Southern Baptist. Barna has discovered the same thing. When we're asked to estimate the likelihood that they would continue to participate in church life once they're living on their own, levels dip precipitously to only about one in every three teens. Okay? Why are they leaving the church? I'd like to show you the answer. It's right here. They don't believe the Bible is the word of God. That's why they're leaving. And I'm going to show you why that happens a little bit in a little while. But this is a startling statistic. And so it means that as a church body, as a family of believers, we're not reaching that next generation with practical understanding of I'll say it this way, the authority of the word of God and how it applies to the world that I live in. Why? Because the world's doing a better job at influencing the mind of our young people than we are. We all know that the Holy Spirit has to do the work, but there's a foundation that's being laid, and it's laid in a child's life. And the Bible says that the foundations be destroyed. What can the righteous do? Well, you know, there's an answer to that question. Amen? Amen. And Nehemiah showed us a little bit of it. He said, what? Let's rebuild the foundation. Amen? 
Just because you've got a cracked foundation, that doesn't mean you can't repair it. Hey, maybe your foundation's cracked and you've got to do some wholesale digging, amen? Maybe you've got to dig up the footings and start all over. That's what happened to me when I got saved, amen? Because that's what I needed. And God is a wonderful master builder when we recognize we got a problem and we yield to him and he begins to show us how to be reconciled unto him and how to take us from where we are and lead us to Christ likeness. I know many of you would raise your hands if I said, how many of you could quote John 3.16? Many of you could. I want to draw your attention to a couple of verses before John 3.16. What's happening here? Nicodemus has come to Christ. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a Sadducee. He's at the top of his game with regards to religious order of his day. And yet he comes to Jesus and he says, hey, and he starts having all these questions. And Jesus says this to him in John 3, 12, if I've taught you of earthly things and you believe not, then how are you going to believe when I teach you of heavenly things? This same theme is repeated later in John chapter 5 when the Lord said, Hey, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. What did he write? First five books of the Bible. Amen? But if you believe not his writings, then how are you going to believe my words? And I submit to you there's a connection about understanding history, understanding the earthly things, and your ability to then understand spiritual things. Because they're connected. And I want to show that to you today. The Bible says in Romans 12 too, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Your worldview. If your worldview is off-center, then you're going to have a hard time reconciling things in the Bible. And so, I want to show you what happens when we change the worldview. It's like a pair of glasses. You see, you look at the world through a lens. Maybe your lens is totally secular. But if you take the word of God like a pair of glasses and you learn how to look at your world through a biblical worldview, it changes your whole perception of the world that we live in. Why? Because the Bible, the Bible is the history book of the universe. Amen? Amen. And the Bible can be trusted in everything it talks about. Science, chemistry, biology, mathematics, morality, whatever it talks about, it can be trusted. And we need to learn how to assimilate the authority of the Word of God into our lives. In the biblical worldview, the Bible is crystal clear. It tells me here in Colossians, for by him, who's that? Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, there in Genesis saying, let us make man in our own image and likeness. He's the creator. By him all things were created. Where? That are in heaven. And have you been to heaven? No. <laughs> Why? You're here. Amen. But things that are in heaven, he created them. And the things that are in the earth, oh, that's us. Visible. Have you seen any visible things? Sure, you got a visible world all around you. But what does it say next? And invisible. You feel the molecules hitting your hand. There's an invisible world, folks. And many of us need to stop living in ignorance and start recognizing that there's a battle going on and there are things happening in an invisible world around us just as much as what we see in the physical world. Because God says that's what he's created. And he defines them a little bit. He says whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Notice all things were created by him and for him. Where did I come from? I came from God. I have no idea how, but I know I came from him. Where am I going to go when I die? Ah, that's something you have a big impact on. But I came from God. I was created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. What do you mean? 
Well, you're going to learn on Wednesday, you've got a hundred trillion cells in your body. A hundred trillion? Yeah. And a million new cells get made every second, more than a million, in your body. Whoa. <laughs> every time you go like that, what happens? Cells fall off. You and I sometimes, we go day by day, we are so clueless about the world that we live in. Amen? Yet the Bible tells me he holds it all together. He's created everything. He's before all things. And by him, all things consist. He is who he said he is. In my worldview, I recognize that. And then I begin reading his word. And his word in the Creation Museum, this is what we use as the storyline, Dr. Gary Parker, a uh, former evolutionist uh, who had two books, two PhDs, then he became a believer because a young lady in one of his classes said, hey, Dr. Parker, have you ever considered an alternative to the way you believe? And she led him to the Lord. And he came up with this acrostic called the seven seas of history. Seven major events that if you learn them, you can learn how to look at your world through the lens of scripture. The first one is creation. Creation is a real event that happened in the history of the world. It affects you and me today. Amen? Sure does. We'll spend a lot of time on this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it now. Why did God create Adam and Eve? Because he wanted fellowship with his creation. And Adam and Eve are unique because they're made in the image of God and they're given a spirit by God. Everything else is different, but Adam and Eve are unique. Why did God do that? He created the whole universe everything in six literal 24-hour days so that he could have fellowship with Adam and Eve. Then what happened? Well, as you'll see, Adam and Eve decided to determine truth for themselves. They didn't listen to the word of God. They ate of a fruit they weren't supposed to. And then God had to judge them because God is holy. And so in that judgment, sin came into the world and it affects the whole universe. So there was a creation, and then what? Sin came into the world. Why? Because of man's actions in the past. God kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. They go out and have children. They populate the earth, and the earth gets very sinful. And then what happens? There's a flood. He judges the world with a worldwide flood. He has a righteous man named Noah, and his family get on an ark. He puts the animals on it, and he destroys the known world. You and I, when we look out today in our world, we see a remnant of a beauty that once existed. But we live in a post-flood world. We'll talk about that world on Tuesday. Amen? And so, a catastrophe. Well, then what happened? Man was supposed to be spreading out across the face of the earth. But he was being disobedient. So God came down and he brought languages into existence. This is a real event that affects you and me today. We're going to talk about that on Wednesday. We're going to talk about that on Tuesday. We're going to talk about it on Monday in details, little parts of it. Really? Language is coming into existence? Yes. Why? Because your understanding of history affects your understanding of learning and knowledge that you get today. And we're going to look at those types of things in relation to what did they record, what did they find, like dinosaurs. You want to understand dinosaurs? You've got to understand a little bit about the Tower of Babel. You'll learn about that in the next hour. Amen? You see, your worldview affects how you live in the world that you live in. What's the next event that happened? Christ. Why did Christ come? Christ came because God wants this relationship with man. Man sins. God tells the devil right there in Genesis that there's one who's coming who's going to crush your head. And then the Old Testament talks about his coming, and now he's here. He arrives. He's born. He's born to die. Why? That man can be reconciled to God so that this relationship can be reestablished in the future. He goes to the cross to pay that debt that's needed because of what happened in the real history of the world. And one day there'll be a future consummation. Amen? You and I have no idea what it would be like to live in a world without sin. We don't. But praise God, I'm looking forward to that day. Amen? Amen? You should say hallelujah. 
I got Baptocostal there. Oh. You know what? It's okay to rejoice in the Lord. Amen? I rejoice because I understand this day is coming. My mother is already experiencing some of it. My dad is experiencing some of it. My father-in-law is experiencing some of it. Someday I'm going to experience it, my wife's going to experience it, and we're going to rejoice. Because right now in the world we live in today, some things are really difficult. Amen? Amen. But I have hope. I have hope because of the real history of the world. As a preacher, I can go into the hospital. I can go into the home of someone who's in hospice. And if biology hasn't impacted their ability to have understanding, I can open the Word of God and I can share real 100% hope to them. Because it is true. It is the real history of the world. And so, my worldview impacts how I live in the present. But what if I can make you believe there's no such thing as a creation? Don't you realize that 6.8 billion years ago there was a big bang? And what if I can say to you, there's no such thing as sin coming into the world. The world has always been about survival of the fittest. Strong in tooth and claw. My grandfather told me when I was a little kid, son, you better be the best at whatever you can be because this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. If you've got to steal to get ahead, then you should steal. If you've got to lie to get ahead, then you should lie because only the strong will survive. That's what I was being taught. And there's no such thing as a worldwide flood. Don't you realize it takes a thousand years for one millimeter of material to be laid down? And there's no such thing as languages coming in from God. Languages came as humans evolved from apes in different parts of the world, and they had experiences. You know, one guy throws a rock at the other guy. Oh, language. That's how we got it. That's where it came from. That's how we got Portuguese. Amen. Chinese. English. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? He said, Nicodemus, if I've told you of earthly things and you believe not, how are you going to believe when I teach you the heavenly things? Ladies and gentlemen, the first four things on that chart are all earthly things. And if you don't understand the earthly things, you're starting to understand why people don't listen to you when you start sharing with them spiritual truth about heavenly things. Because the earthly things have clouded their mind. Where did Cain get his wife? Number one asked question in all the years of ministry I've had. What about dinosaurs in the Bible? We'll answer that in the next hour. Why is there death and suffering? If God is such a loving God. Had anybody spout off to you about that yet? It's out there. And they're real questions. And the reason they don't understand these things is because they're blind in the first four. I want to show you how we can take the authority of the Word of God and we can overlay it in the real world that we live in and make sense of outer space. We can make sense of the Grand Canyon and geology. We can make sense of morality in the family. We can even make sense of dinosaurs. Why? Because this is the real history of the world. And what I find in my world agrees with what I read in God's Word. You see, evolution says science has proven you can't trust the Bible. Let me show you where the rubber meets the road. It meets the road right here in that word science. And really what's at stake is two areas of science. One's called operational science. The other is called historical science. Operational science is something that happens in the present. It's repeatable. It's observable. You take a pot of water. It's cool. Put it on the stove. Turn the heat on. It boils. You take it off. Repeatable. Observable. Operational science has benefited you and me massively. We're sitting in a church building on pews on top of a floor underneath people are meeting. We've got electricity. We don't even know what electricity is. We just know how to harness it. Amen? We've got computers. Some of you have had biological operations which are mind-blowing. You've got another heart. You've got another valve. You've got all of these things that have come from operational science. That's how they have been 
discovered and understood and operational science in the Christian, we believe in it 100%. Amen? Because what it is, is it's revealing what God has done in the world that we live in. And we use it for his honor and glory. For to what? To benefit mankind. But historical science, that's something that happened in the past. That's something that happened one time and wasn't seen by anybody. Like the Grand Canyon. Can we reproduce the Grand Canyon? No. It happened. And I want you to watch the screen because historical science, that's the creation evolution discussion. Because they're both stories about what happened in the past. And we can't go and do operational science in the present and remake a Grand Canyon. So what we have to do is we have to use the Word of God understand what he said that's happened in the past, then we can use operational science in the present, we can look at our world in the present, and we can ask ourselves this question, which one of these two stories about the past makes the most sense? Why? Because it's a faith position for either one. Amen? That's what it is. It's a faith position. And that's what we're going to discuss. You realize we all the same facts? Here's a fact. Amen? This is a casting, okay? This is a copy. The real one is very brittle, and Skip couldn't afford it anyway. Amen? <laughs> so he buys a casting. This is a casting of a... Hold your hand out, okay? And put your fingers together. So now you have three fingers out. So think of a velociraptor, a really large one, about 20 feet tall. He's got two little arms, and on the right-hand arm... Okay, he's got three fingers. This is the nail from the middle finger of the right appendage of a mega velociraptor found in Peru. That's the nail. Okay, it's not a horn. Okay, it's not a horn. Okay, it's not. It's a nail, like a claw on a dog or a cat. And so here it is. You know, when they dug this up, did they have a tag on it to tell them what it was? Nope. All they got is what? This. And this is a fact. It's evidence. But you see, evidence, what? Doesn't speak for itself. All facts are interpreted, right? Yeah. And all facts are interpreted based upon presuppositions in your mind. Let me give you a silly example. You ready? This is the nail from a mega velociraptor, and it's from a male mega velociraptor. How do I know? It doesn't have any nail polish on it. Okay? You see, that is bad presupposition. Amen? I do not know if there were any saleswomen out there in the mega velociraptor world selling products to put on their nails. I have no idea. I wasn't there. And neither were you. Amen? And so, we have something that happened in the past. It's a real animal. We dug this up. And here it is. All facts are interpreted based upon a presupposition. And you see, this is the battleground in the mind. You see, it's the worldview. And that interpretation of the evidence, that is the battleground. And I submit to you that after the next four days, you're going to understand why I can stand up here and be so adamant about the authority of the Word of God. Because what I find in my world agrees with what I read in God's Word. And that's what I should find if this is the history of the world. Amen? This next quote is on four slides. I want you to understand you need to slowly read this quote. Because this quote really sums it up. We're talking about Dr. Richard Lewontin, professor of genetics at Harvard University. He's an intelligent man. He's influencing many people. Listen to what he has to say about this bias in what they do. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is a key to understanding the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. In spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life. In spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories. Have you ever told an unsubstantiated just-so story? That's called a lie, okay? 
We do it, why? In spite of the tolerance of lying. Because we have an a priori commitment, a commitment to materialism. I want you to notice the word that he used. <clears throat> a priori. The definition means we have a way based on theoretical deduction rather than empirical observation. A commitment to materialism. Notice it again. It's not that the methods of the institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. But on the contrary, that we are forced by our, there's that word again, a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation. So what's he doing? We are basing the way that we think on theory rather than real science in the present. <coughs> Why? And a set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute. Why? Because we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Okay, make that simple for me, Skip. All right, here it is. We are not going to do anything in science that allows God in. Period. So what does that mean? That means all the textbooks that are being written and all the research that's being done, whenever God starts coming into the program, the funding stops. Did you know that? Do you realize that this is the mindset of those who are scientists? <clears throat> They're not looking at the world for real, empirical, scientific evidence. They have a mindset that is set against the authority of the Word of God. Why? Because if God is God, then God sets the rules. There's accountability. If God is not in control, then you know what? Abortion is absolutely fine. Kill the cat, kill the kid. What's the difference? It's all just material. You see that? And that's the battle in the mind. And that battle's being played out in institutions all across the world every day. Second Peter says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Verse 5 says, they're ignorant of what? Of the flood. <clears throat> what we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's word. How do I know? Let me show you how we do it. Here's the Grand Canyon, right? That's a big hole in the earth. The question is, how did it get there? You go out there and the naturalist says, you know, I think a little bit of water in a long, long time. I look at it and I say, I think a lot of water in a little bit of time. How can I do that? It takes millions of years to make a canyon, right? Well, how long does it take to make a canyon? It doesn't take millions of years to make a canyon, ladies and gentlemen. It just takes the right conditions. And I want you to say that. It just takes the right conditions. How do I know? Because we went to Mount St. Helens, 1981. Scientists knew all of the land points all around this volcano. And when it, excuse me, 1980. <clears throat> and when it blew up, here's a canyon that gets created after the volcanic eruption. How did this canyon get created? They pumped water out of Spirit Lake, which is adjacent to the mountain, and it went through the Toodle River Valley, and this canyon was created in 29 months. 90 feet deep, 100 and some feet wide. There it is. Does it take millions of years to make a canyon? No, it just takes what? The right conditions. Not fast enough for you? We jump over a couple of canyons to this one, the Little Grand Canyon. In the bottom of this canyon, the bottom 30 feet is basalt rock, the hardest rock known to man. It was carved out 29 months? No. 29 weeks? No. 29 days? No. 29 hours? No. It was carved out in about four hours on March 19, 1982. It is, and that's a 140th scale in size to the Grand Canyon. So what do I know? It doesn't take millions of years to make a canyon. It just takes what? The right conditions. So now the evolutionist has lost that one slug he has in his gun to point at me saying, I don't believe the Bible. Well, you don't have that one. How about this one? What about rock layers? It doesn't take millions of years to make rock layers. It just takes what? 
the right conditions. How do I know? I go back to the Grand Canyon where this lady is standing. That used to be the, the ground before the eruption. Then there were four events after the eruption. The first was the airfall that filled up the land. The second one happened on June 2nd. A flow came off the mountain, filled it up even higher. And then a third one came two years later. And then there was another event, and it came through there and created a canyon. And now we see a cross-section of what has happened in time. Three distinct layers. Does it take millions of years to make a rock layer? No. It just takes what? The right conditions. How do I know? Real empirical science in the present. Uh-oh. Did we lose everything? No. Amen. And so, then we zoom in on this one, right? Notice the microfine laminations. We take a, a, uh, a microscope. We can see the crystals as they're changing in different directions in finite, tiny layers, all created at once. Does it take a thousand years to make a rock layer? It just takes the right conditions. What about fossils? Does it take millions of years to make a fossil? No, it just takes what? The right conditions. How do I know? I look at the fossil record. That is a flounder. It's identical to the flounder that I caught as a kid growing up in New England. If evolution were true, it should have changed massively over time. It hasn't. Here's a sack of flour. Okay, buried in a, in a mineral-rich water in a spring in a limestone strata. Didn't take millions of years to make it. It just took the right conditions. Here's an ichthyosaur. Notice it's giving birth. Okay? It's rapid. It's catastrophic. It takes the right conditions to make fossils. Maybe you're going to have this for lunch. Amen? That's a, maybe not this one, but this is a petrified ham. See the stitching in it right there? Here's another one, a hat, TYR in New Zealand, buried in 1886 in a volcanic eruption, a felt hat. 20 years later, they dug it out. It went in as a felt hat, came out as a hard hat. Amen? <laughs> that takes millions of years to make fossils. It just takes the right conditions. Kids, here's one for you. A couple of kids and their family in Australia walking on the beach. The kid kicked this rock. It's got a matchbox car in it. Okay? What's the point? The point is, through secular media, I'm told lies all the time. The majority of the people that post those articles are not scientists. They're just copy editors trying to get another story to sell more space for advertising revenue. That's what it is. Here's a, here's a well. Uh, in, uh, this one's from our country in Louisiana. Filled in. Solid rock in very few amount of years. This is a coelacanth. This fish is found in the same layers as dinosaurs. Right? The evolutionist says it lived 340 million years ago and died out 72 million years ago until they caught one off the coast of Madagascar in 1938. This is called a living fossil. You're going to learn just how many things that are living on the earth that are in the fossil record next to dinosaurs. It's going to shock your worldview and what you've been taught about fossils. Here's a clock in a rock. And so what's the point? The point is, is that this whole idea that evolution says science has proven you can't trust the Bible, there's a Greek word for this. It's called hagiai washioso. Okay? <laughs> Hogwash, because it's just the opposite. Because what I find in my world agrees with what I see in God's word. Some of you walked in here this morning and you've heard people tell you that, you know, there's long days of time before Genesis happened. That it wasn't six literal days. I want to ask you a question. Here's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and God says it's very good, it's completed. It's perfected. It's just the way I want it. Are you telling me that Adam and Eve live in a garden that underneath them is what? Layers upon layers of material that's full of dead things? There's even thorns in the fossil record. And we know thorns didn't come into existence until after the curse. Amen? So when we look at our world, what we see is what we find in God's word. So I wonder this morning... When you think of evolution, 
Some of you don't realize they think death and suffering has been happening ever since the world's been here. But actually, the Bible says death is a temporary part of the whole history of the world, and someday it's going to be done away. And so the Bible's very clear. When we look at everything that happens in the Word of God, marriage, clothing, the seven-day week, all these things are founded in the book of Genesis. And the Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. That's why Jesus came. He came because of the real history of the world. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, according to what? According to the authority of the Word of God. According to the Scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day. It was a perfect world. Right now we live in a world that has intrusion of sin. Someday there will be a new heaven and earth. And the Bible really is the history book of the universe. Six more slides and we're done. So here's where it all comes down to right here. Little boy says to his friend, hey, Jesus loves you. The Bible says so. And his friend used to be like me. Ah, the Bible isn't true. Where did Cain get his wife? Where do dinosaurs fit in the Bible? How do you know there's a God? Where did all the races come from if God created Adam and Eve? He says, I don't know. And his friend says, see, I told you the Bible isn't true. And then he goes home to mom and dad. Mom and dad, can you answer these problems with the Bible? Where did Cain get his wife? Where do dinosaurs fit in the Bible? How do you know God exists? Where did all the races come from? Mom and dad say, we don't know. You know what happens to this fellow right here? He becomes one of the 88% that are going to walk out of the church never to return. Why? Because he never got answers from the authority of the Word of God. That's how important this is. Some of you came in today and you walked through those doors back there and you said, What is all this stuff? You know why all those books and tapes and things are back there? They're there to help you so that you never do what's on that screen. That you might say to your son or daughter or granddaughter or grandson or the one you've got from overseas staying with you, Hey, my beloved, I don't know the answer yet, but let's go and find out together because there is an answer. Amen? That's what we have to do. We have to rebuild the foundation in the worldview of our thinking when it comes to these things that we find in the world because it's all about the authority of the word of God. You see, that's why Jesus said, that, and by the way, you can't be saved apart from the real history of the world. You can't. And that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, if I told you of earthly things and you believe not, then how are you going to believe when I tell you of heavenly things? Which is why he comes in verse 16, hey, God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. And that was him talking. He is the son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have that everlasting life. How do I get everlasting life? Well, it's very simple. It just takes the right conditions. Amen? How do I get my relationship right with God? It takes the right conditions. How are you doing on your worldview? Have you let the world influence the way that you think? Or are you even in the word? Trying to learn what God has for you that you might be able to discern. You know, when you need wisdom, all you have to do is ask God. That's his promise. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Sometimes some of us aren't even asking. Oh, our God loves us so much. He holds every molecule of you and me together. He holds every molecule of everything we come across in our life together. He loves us more than you and I could ever fathom. And some of you need to let him in. Let him in. And others of you need to ask for forgiveness and reestablish that relationship. And some of you are doing a good job. And I want to encourage you to keep influencing others right here in our community for God's honor and God's glory. Why? Because he's worthy. And he is the creator. And he's coming again. Pastor? Pastor?